Kia ora and welcome back to Wellywood Wargaming. My name is Damon and in this episode I'm going to be talking to you about Necromunda list building. Um, this is something that a few of you have been asking me on many occasions actually on how to build a list, um, what sort of recommendations I would give and here I'm going to give you one of each of the six houses in Necromunda. Um, none of the other gangs as yet but if this video is successful I will go and do the other gangs outside of the six houses as well but one of each uh, is my kind of recommended list in each. Uh, I'll give you my reasoning and rationale behind each of the choices that I've made and um, just give you a little bit of insight. Um, but all of these lists I've either played with or had some experience with and it's all based on lots of actual playtime and experience. So again, you might not agree with all of these choices. They are my own ideas. So, um, you know, feel free to, to comment and tell me where I went wrong and stuff. But um, I feel that these are six of my sort of most optimal or favorite lists that we've got here. Um, so anyway, without further ado, we'll get into it. Starting off with the Filthy Boys of House Cordor, probably my favorite gang, if I'm honest. Um, this one is the biggest and most numerous in terms of the, the amount of fighters that I've put in this 1,000 credit starting list. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that, of course, with House Cordor, if you're not familiar, you have the Redemptionist side of things and you have the Cordor side of things. Of course, um, you can do one of either. You can have a Cordor gang, you can have a Redemptionist gang, or you can have a mixture. I think, personally, that having the mixed approach is usually the best with House Cordor. Um, and it, just bear in mind that if you do go more Redemptionists, you are by default an outlaw in the campaign setting. If you go with more Cordor, you are by default uh, lawful until proven an outlaw. Um, but getting into it anyway, we're going to start with the leader, of course. Um, in this instance, I have chosen a Redemptionist leader instead of a Cordor leader. The reason for this is I just feel that the equipment is slightly better for the Redemptionist leader personally. I just really like Redemptionists in general, but we've gone for a Redemptor Priest here. Um, yeah, and again, the, the equipment is really key here. The stats are basically the same for, for both of them, pretty much similar anyway. Um, but for the loadout on this guy, we have given him an auto pistol, um, just as a backup sidearm, and his uh, close combat weapon of a chain axe. Um, and the chain axe, I think, is going to come up quite a lot in a few of these lists because it is really that good. It's also quite cheap. It's got lots and lots of weapon traits. It's got parry, disarm, rending. Um, and it's plus one to hit in close combat as well, meaning that your Redemptor Priest is then hitting on twos in close combat. I do feel that this is just a really um, optimal choice for a close combat weapon for anyone, to be honest, um, as particularly a leader. Also, um, to complement your Chain Axe, we've given it an Exterminator cartridge, which is a 15 credit one-shot hand flamer, um, which if you ask me for 15 credits is absolutely a must-have on any Cordor or Redemptionist list. Um, of course, you can't get those for Cordor leaders, so that's pretty much why I've chosen it here. Uh, we've given him Flak Armor as well, and the skill of choice here um, is a Piety skill, and it's probably my favorite Piety skill as well, and that's Unshakable Conviction. Now, Unshakable Conviction means that you cannot be coup de grade, and if you are, if someone does attempt to attack you while you're seriously injured, you get reactionary attacks and you can also make a double action uh, called flock together in the recovery phase where you can move, I think, D6 plus your movement uh, towards the nearest fighter in an aid to, uh, to, you know, to help your recovery process. So really strong leader there, not the best leader out of the six houses that we've got here, but still very, very competent in close combat. Um, so that's the one I've gone for. Moving on now to your champions. The two champions that I've chosen here are both Cordor champions. They are not Redemptionist champions. Again, it's kind of the flip side of what I just said about the Redemptionist leader there. I do prefer the Cordor champions myself. <laughs> the reason being is, is just purely on the equipment. However, they do not get good skill access and that's something that Cordor champions really, really do miss out on. But is it enough um, to take the Redemptionist champions in this case? No, I don't think it is. The first firebrand that we're gonna go with um, has a reclaimed auto pistol as a backup weapon and a heavy crossbow. Now the heavy crossbow is of course a heavy weapon, you can't move and shoot with it, so you do need to get into good position to use it because we don't have a suspensor here as well, but flinging five inch strength four frag templates around with the option of crack as well is just fantastic. Um, in terms of the skill choices here though, um, we've gone with ball charge because to be honest, you're only gonna get brawn and combat skills, which is a bit of a shame on these shooty guys. Um, the champions in this case, the two fire brands, are definitely your shooting sort of fire base in this gang. Um, so yeah, the heavy crossbow is definitely something I wouldn't miss out on. It's, it's very, very fun. It's a very fun one. The five inch template is just so nice. Um, the second fire brand we're gonna go with is uh, a little bit um, 
a little bit cheaper, in fact 100 credits cheaper than the, uh, the former. And he's got a long rifle uh, with flak armor and the parry skill. Of course, like I said, you only get combat and uh, brawn skills and you're not going to be using those skills much as you're um, both shooters, but parry really is just a backup to keep you alive if you do get someone attacking you and closing the distance at some point. So that is your leadership unit for My House Corridor recommended list. We're now moving on to the sort of bulk of the gang and the first part of that is the specialist. So we're gonna pick a specialist here in every single gang. The specialist in this case is not a Corridor specialist, it is a Redemptionist specialist. And again, just purely on the equip equipment access here, you're probably gonna hear me say this quite a few times, but grenade launchers are gonna come up a lot. This specialist is no different in that he takes a grenade launcher fantastic weapon uh, as a special weapon it's only 65 credits um, with frag and crack and he's got an auto pistol as well just as a backup because the ammo on the grenade launcher is not great plus you know the pistol can be used in close combat as well so that's what we've got on our specialist um, moving on to the brethren now uh, we've got two uh, in fact, one Redemptionist Brethren here, actually, instead of Cordor Brethren. We've gone for a Redemptionist Brethren because he offers us something a little bit different in terms of range. So we've got Auto Gun with a um, Exterminator cartridge on that. So for 30 credits, you've got a 24-inch Rapid Fire weapon with a backup Hand Flamer one-shot on there as well, which to me is just excellent. Um, moving on to the other two gangers, we've got two Cordor Brethren here. Neither have armor, um, but they both have what we call Blunder Poles, which are the most hideously under-costed and most effective weapons or basic weapons in the game, I would say. They are a versatile close combat weapon with two types of template weapons attached on the end. So we have a uh, template with blaze, which is incredibly valuable indeed and very, very powerful. You've also got a template with um, scattershot as well. So two excellent templates on um, a versatile weapon, which also gives you plus strength too. Um, what's not to like about that for 40 credits. So these guys clock in at 90 credits each, but they're worth every single cent if you ask me. Um, the last thing that we have in this are two bone pickers. So bone pickers are your cord or juves. Again, this kind of makes the balance of the list slightly more cord or heavy, meaning that you're not, um, you're not outlaws. Um, but these two bone pickers, they're very, very cheap, coming in at 35 credits, and they've both got stub guns and axes. Stub guns are excellent on any type of juve, just because of that plus two to hit close range. Axes, only 10 credits give you um, plus one strength and disarm as well. So nine gangers in this list, I think, is essential. Cordor are a hoardy gang. They are going to generally have more numbers than your opponent. If you don't have more numbers than your opponent, then you're probably playing Cordor wrong, if you ask me. Um, they should be a cordy, um, a, a hoardy, cordy, hoardy gang in general, and um, yeah, I think that's that's where you want to go with Cordor. Nine fighters is loads, and you've got some really good kit in there as well. Lots and lots of template weapons, and shitloads of template weapons, in fact. Um, in terms of the Articles of Faith, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but my recommended uh, um, path of the f uh, path of faith is probably Path of the Doomed, which has the most swingy and most fun and fluffy options in it, if you ask me, but Path of the Fanatic is also worth a shot too, because you've got stuff that gives you a free uh, move simple action to, to be able to get your blaze templates in at the cost of a flesh wound, things like that. Um, so those two are options. You can also mix and match your articles as well, but can be a little bit cheesy and a bit OP, but that's what we're here for. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend Path of the Doomed. It's definitely my favorite one so far, um, but there are you know, four to choose from. Um, that is my recommended Cordor starting list, and that's coming from someone who's played Cordor quite a bit. As you know, they're my favorite gang. So you could change things a little bit. You could bring a Fire Pike in instead of the Heavy Crossbow. I do really like the Fire Pike, but I think for the sake of balance, um, having some range and having another different type of template weapon is quite important here because you've already got those blunder poles, you've already got those exterminators. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my recommendation for Cordor. Right then, moving on to the sneaky boys of Necromunda, of course, and that is House de Lac, um, probably my second favorite or joint favorite gang in the game. Um, really, really fun to play, and the list that I've got here for you today is really nice and balanced again. You'll notice that I use the word balance quite a lot because I do feel that it's really important when it comes to list building, um, and I'll explain why at the end of this video, really. But um, in this gang, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, eight fighters, which is actually pretty good. Um, some of the fighters are quite cheap. Your gangers are cheap, your juves are cheap. Um, the rest is quite expensive, but it, the key here really is making a nice balanced list. Um, 
Now with House to Lack, you've got Psychoterica, which is their sort of special thing that they do, and that's obviously weird powers. You don't have to go down the Psychoterica route, but I do recommend it, it is fun. Um, and you can do some really cheeky, cheeky stuff with it as well. Um, so we've got a mixture of sneaky and stealthy, and we've got a mixture of um, Psychoterica here as well in this list. So getting into it, um, starting off with your Master of Shadow, this is your leader. I've upgraded him to a Psyker so that he does come with a psychic power um, for a cost. But in terms of his equipment, he's got an auto pistol for five credits. It's worth noting that auto pistols are only five credits for House to Lack, which is fantastic. So take advantage of that. Other than that, I would say don't generally get him stuck in close combat. I think the Delac leader is better as a sort of utility guy. Of course, we've, we've gone with the Psychoterica here as well, which I'll explain in, in a second, but I think giving him a ranged weapon is better than giving him close combat weapons in this instance. Um, and I've gone for a plasma gun, of course, because plasma guns for 100 credits just do a hell of a lot of damage output. And House Delac, if you ask me, don't actually have a lot of high damage weapons, to be honest. Um, they have lots of special weapons and cheeky tricks and stuff, but you do need some high damage in a Delac list because the rest of the list doesn't necessarily punch that hard. Um, so a plasma gun here, of course you can use it on low most of the time. It's still strength five with minus one AP and rapid fire. It's very tasty indeed, but you can also use it on maximal as well. Um, just make sure it doesn't blow up in your hands. But if you do use it on maximal, of course, you're taking out ambots and whatnot with it, which is pretty nice too. Um, in terms of, he's got mesh armor, but in terms of the skills, we've chosen evade on this one, which is a cunning skill. Evade, it means that he's harder to hit in in the open. So if he's not in cover and you get the drop of him, drop on him, it's minus two to hit at long range, minus one to hit at short range. So it's pretty nice. Just keeps him alive a little bit longer as well. And of course, for the psychoteric skill that we've gone here, is Penumbral Mirror, which allows you to slingshot another fighter around the board. It's really, really, really cheeky. Um, you can do some really cool stuff with it, um, especially in conjunction with the next fighter that I'm going to talk about now, and that is, of course, the Nacked Ghoul. Now, the Nacked Ghoul is my favorite, absolute favorite piece in the entire game, if you ask me. The reason why is because of the mind games that you can play on your opponent. The Nacked Ghoul can basically come on at the start of any turn that you like. You can hold them off for as long as you like, leaving your opponent guessing as to when you're gonna bring them on and constantly um, force your opponent to think about their positioning and think about what they're up to because that Nacked Ghoul can just come on at any moment and really, really put a spanner in the works. Um, especially when they come with Serpent's Fangs. Now, Serpent's Fangs have phase, meaning that you don't get a save against them. They hit on twos, they are a whopping plus two strength, meaning that you're wounding on twos as well. Um, and they are paired too. So you will have, what, six attacks on the charge hitting on twos, I believe. Um, I've also given this guy Mesh Armor Clamber as a starting skill, which is um, an agility skill. Um, now you might think Clamber is a weird choice to give to a Nacked Ghoul, but this is kind of a sniper killer build. So what it means is Clamber, you can just walk straight up buildings and stuff like you're not climbing. It's just your regular movement. So you can just run up a three-story building and slay a heavy bolter champion or something. It's a pretty cool thing to be able to do and just to be able to traverse the battlefield a bit more. Um, readily I suppose. Um, I also think it's quite important to give uh, your Nacked Ghoul a, a ranged weapon, so I've gone for a five credit auto pistol here as well. The reason why is that if you don't win priority and you come on in that first turn and you're kind of stuck out in the open, not really being able to charge somebody, um, then that auto pistol can just be quite handy to have. If not, then per perhaps grenades or even throwing knives as well can also be quite useful for the Nacked Ghoul too. Um, but that's your Nacked Ghoul. I love them. I think they're brilliant. If you're not playing Nacked Ghouls in Delac Gangs, you are seriously missing out, if you ask me. Same with Death Maidens and Stimmers. The Phantom, your next champion, uh, the most generic champion, I suppose, in this gang, of course, goes for the most cheesy possible combination of a web gun and infiltrate. Um, with mesh armor. So infiltrate, meaning that you can set up anywhere on the board, pretty much, and uh, the web gun is probably the most broken weapon in the entire game. No save is allowed. If you get wounded by it, then you are counting as seriously injured as well. So very nasty indeed. So your leadership base here is quite scary actually. Uh, a Master of Shadow with Penumbral Mirror, slingshotting your Nacked Ghoul into close combat against people. You've also got the, him possibly slingshotting your web gun as well. It's, it's really nasty indeed, this one. Moving on to the general fighters in the list though, we've got uh, a specialist of course. In this instance you don't get access to a grenade launcher, so of course I've chosen the second option here which is the long rifle. So we've got a snipey snipey specialist here and long rifles are just great on the lack lists anyway. Um, 
with mesh armor as well. Not much else to talk about there, but the uh, lo you know the long rifle is just fantastic. Really, strength four minus one AP and knockback. It's just a weapon that you can't really argue with. It's good on any list. Um, not everybody gets access to them, of course, so um, you know um, take advantage of that too. The next thing you've got is two ghosts. Now these are Dalak gangers. Um, the first one I've given a las gun. Um, no armor, but just a las gun. I think the las gun is my preferred choice over an auto gun on a Dalak list, just because I prefer the accuracy and the the fact that it's plentiful and stuff too. You know, plus one to hit at 18 inch range is pretty nice. Um, and when you're using it as a sort of pinning mechanic mainly, you're not really going to hurt stuff with your las guns, but it's great to have that pinning guy who can pin stuff for your web gun and your next goal to um, engage in closer range and stuff is really handy. The next ghost I've gone for is a shotgunner with solid and scatter of course. Um, the reason why I chose a shotgun on this guy for 30 credits is just because I still feel like this list doesn't have enough damage output without it so having a weapon that does have two damage and strength four is just really nice to have as well. The last part of the gang is made up of a Psygeist. Now the Psygeist in this instance has just a stub gun, but we've chosen him because he's got access to Psychoterica, of course. Now Psygeists don't start off that well, but once they get the Psychoteric Worms later on in the campaign, they can become really powerful indeed. The Psychoteric uh, power that we've chosen in this instance is of course Spatial Psychosis, which is a pinning one. Basically it's a simple action and you can pin a fighter within a certain amount of range. Of course that's going to get better once you've got your Psychoteric Worm as well, but it's just a really nice um, sort of cheeky thing to do. It's also a simple so you can do it twice in an activation too. Last but not least, we've got a Delac Shadow. Delac Shadows are your juves. They're very, very cheap. Um, this one is only 30 credits because he's only starting with an auto pistol, um, but pretty nice, just good to have. You can obviously give him a stiletto knife later on down the track or even some flash grenades or smoke grenades as well, just to be even more annoying, but just to fill out the ranks in that list really. But a nice, well-rounded, well-balanced, a bit of damage, a bit of scariness, a bit of sneakiness, and a bit of psychoterica in this Delac list. I think it's a really good one. What do you think? Let me know um, as we move on to the next one. Moving on to the Fair Maidens of Necromunda, House Escher. Um, this is a really nice list, actually. This is probably the one I've played with the least, actually, or the, le the house gang that I've played with the least, but I still think that this list is very powerful. Um, starting off with the queen here, of course, this is your Escher leader. I've gone for a close combat profile here purely because you have three base attacks, which is quite unique to Escher leaders. Um, fantastic, really, um, four attacks on the charge, five if you've got a pistol as well. So in this instance, of course, of course, I've given her a chain axe and a plasma pistol. Plasma pistol for the damage output and um, and the range as well is quite nice to have a, a you know a pistol as well. But a chain axe um, for the plus one to hit, you know, five attacks, four of them hitting on twos and uh, perhaps an overcharged plasma pistol when you get into close combat is very very scary indeed. The um, skill of choice here is sprint actually on this one. Of course there are other options but I quite like sprint. It gives you as a double move you can make a 15 inch move instead of a 10 inch move um, meaning that you can out position your opponent quite nicely and that's what I like about Escher. I think they should be played as a sort of hit and run gang. There are a bit of a glass cannon, but the sort of hit and run gang, being able to outmaneuver and outposition, I think is, is quite a nice style of play, if you ask me. She's also got mesh armor as well, just giving her a bit of a reliable piece of armor there too. Moving on to the next piece, and arguably another um, equally almost as good as the Nactical. I'm not sure which is better actually, it's up for debate, but the Death Maiden is just excellent. If you're playing Escher without a Death Maiden, then you're just doing it all wrong in my opinion. Death Maidens are just too good to miss out on. They add a bit of extra um, flexibility. They're fast, they're tough, they've got really good call. Cool, um, so they act as a sort of anchor to your Escher gang, if you ask me a little bit in that respect. But for 185 credits, we've got a very, very powerful fighter here with mesh armor. We've given her a needle pistol to take advantage of the, um, you know, the poison blood uh, rule where you can re-roll ones to wound. Um, and we've also given her a venom claw as well to further complement that venom claws are excellent, they're minus two um, AP and also toxin, they can't be parried either. Um, so she really, really hits hard, especially when you give her a skill like spring up. Spring up meaning on a two plus, you can stand up from being pinned and just carry on your activations as normal, meaning that you are always, always a threat even from pinned, um, charging uh, a reliable nine inches sometimes as well. Um, combine that with a few other skills later on down the track or even other weapons and she gets even more scary indeed. 
Moving on to your champion, your generic Escher champion now, and that's your matriarch. In this instance, because we've got a close combat leader and a close combat death maiden, of course it was only natural to take a high powered um, ranged weapon, and that is of course in this instance the plasma gun. Again, plasma guns for 100 credits I just think are phenomenal weapons with a high damage output. Sure, um, the ammo is not great and they are scarce, but you're only going to be shooting them a couple of times in a game and when you do shoot stuff with them, you're generally killing it. So really nice there. We've got flak armor and dodge as well. Dodge giving you a six up invuln save just to keep you alive a little bit longer too. Um, and that is your sort of leadership base for the House Escher list that I've come up with here as well. Moving on to the Escher specialist, uh, you know, she's slightly different to the other specialists that I would recommend, um, purely because she gets access to something that's quite unique to House Escher, or is completely unique to House Escher, and that is the Chem Thrower. Now the Nightshade Chem Thrower isn't that good on paper, it doesn't start off being that good. It can be, but the problem is that it doesn't pin stuff. However, when you get into chem, chem alchemy later on down the track in a campaign, this is where this thing gets incredibly scary with a couple of combinations. You can make it OP as fuck. Um, so the specialist gets the nightshade chem thrower in this instance, mainly because it's a template weapon and she's only ballistic skill four. Of course, you could, could have given that to the champion, but I feel like the champion is better off with the plasma gun due to her having a uh, ballistic skill three plus there as well. So the, um, the nightshade chem thrower on the specialist there, um, she doesn't actually have any armor though, unfortunately, because we can't afford it in the starting list though. Um, moving on to the next part, and that is two sisters, both identically armed with just las guns for 55 credits. Um, 50 credits for the ganger, five credits for a las gun is incredibly cheap. Of course, las guns are normally 15 credits for most gangs, five credits for house Escher. So take advantage of that if you can. These guys are basically a sort of fire support, again, similar to your Dilac one there. Um, these guys suppressing fire can pin stuff while your Death Maiden and your Chem Thrower and your leader can move into closer range and take targets out in close combat. So nice and balanced there. You've got the extra punch from the Plasma Gun at range as well. Um, last but not least though, we've got two Little Sisters. Little Sisters are your Juves. They're not prospects. I've not put any prospects in this list because I just don't think they're quite good enough for a starting list personally. Little Sisters, however, at 45 credits a pop with a stiletto knife and a stub gun are fantastic. Um, the reason why I've given them stiletto knives and stub guns, stub guns are obviously great at close range, plus two to hit at six. Um, but really the stiletto knife uh, really shines on the Little Sisters. You know, if you can get a 45 credit Little Sister um, to charge a Goliath leader or an Orlock leader with three wounds and one of those wounds goes through with the stiletto knife, it can be night night for that two 300 credit cost leader. Um, so can be very valuable. Of course, these are more just a, a threat, just being able to have those um, missiles that you can launch at people and hope that you hit them with toxin. Very nasty indeed. Um, and that is my Escher starting list. Um, again, eight fighters, which is fantastic really for any list. I think numbers are quite important for House Escher. They can be a little bit fragile. Um, I think numbers are important full stop, but I'm gonna go into that in a bit more detail at the end of this video. And that's House Escher. Now for the macho man Randy Savage uh, lookalikes of uh, Necromunda, House Goliath, of course, the muscle boys. Um, House Goliath starting lists are pretty easy to make and you can make some very, very, very powerful lists very, very easily and you can really take advantage of gene smithing if you want to. I've included a bit of gene smithing here. I could go to town on it completely, but I'm not going to confuse you too much. Again, this video is kind of aimed at beginners, so don't overcomplicate things too much. Uh, if you want to be that min-max guy, you can go crazy with gene smithing, but here I've given you a few examples of what you can do with it. So straight off, we've got the Forge Tyrant, which is the Goliath leader, probably the best leader in the game, to be honest. He's just an absolute beast. And I've gone for a mixed, um, a mixed approach in his loadout. A bit of close combat, a bit of range here. The range, in terms of that, we've got a bolt gun. Of course, bolt guns are one of the best weapons in the game. They've got high damage output, rapid fire, minus one AP and damage two. Can put anything down pretty much on a given day. Um, we've also got a, um, a chain axe, of course, because chain axes are really that great for the plus two to, you know, plus one to hit a close combat, meaning that you're hitting on twos again with rending, disarm, parry, etc. I've said it again, um, you know, but chain axes are just so, so good. Um, we've got true grit as a skill there. True grit meaning that you're just a bit tougher, um, means you take less damage when you do go down to your last wound. Um, and of course we've got furnace plates and dermal hardening. Now dermal hardening is one of the gene smithing upgrades that you can take for only 10 credits, you can get toughness five. 
So toughness five as opposed to toughness four is very, very good indeed. It means the bolt guns are hurting you on fives. Um, the only thing that hits you, uh, wounds you on a four is a, is a plasma gun and stuff like that. So it changes dramatically to, uh, you know, how, how much tougher you are in the game. So thermal hardening and true grit makes your leader very survivable indeed. You've got good range, you've got good close combat there as well. Moving on now to your specialist champion, and that is your Goliath Stimmer. This guy we've gone with paired pulverizers, giving you that paired trait, meaning that you've got eight attacks on the charge. Hitting on two with pulverize is very, very nasty indeed. This guy needs to be charging as often as possible, so I've complemented him with Nerves of Steel as his skill of choice, meaning that on a four up, you don't get pinned. Um, so a fighter that's got such good call in conjunction with Nerves of Steel is absolutely essential, if you ask me. Um, and he's of course got dermal hardening and furnace plates too, so also toughness 5 and very, very, very scary in close combat indeed. Um, the last part of your leadership group is your Goliath Forge boss here and we've gone for a heavy option here just to make it a bit more fun and fluffy. And of course we've gone with arguably the best heavy weapon in the game and that's the heavy bolter. Um, you know, a huge, huge damn output, it's rapid fire. It's really nasty. Um, I've also combined this with uh, furnace plates and nerves of steel again. Um, nerves of steel is quite important on a heavy weapon who hasn't got a suspenser because you can't move and shoot with it. If you do get into a good firing position, you wanna make sure that you can stand and return fire without having to just stand up constantly and do nothing. Um, so very, very important on a heavy weapon, I would say. And that's your leadership group for House Goliath. I haven't given any Gene Smithing to the Forge boss there. I just thought it was a bit much if I just went Toughness 5 and all of them. Um, plus, we didn't have enough credits in the end either. Moving on to the next bit, we've got two bruisers. The first one is, of course, a specialist. And, of course, I've given him the grenade launcher. Um, I do feel like G Goliaths kind of need a grenade launcher. You can also give them smoke grenades as well. Smoke grenades can be really good for House Goliath. Just running through smoke can really save you bacon. Um, in, in their sort of play style. But we've gone with a grenade launcher. We've also got an axe and furnace plates there as well. The grenade launcher is likely to run out of ammo, so just having a backup close combat weapon can also be good. Any Goliath is good in close combat. The other bruiser um, is just a standard bruiser, but with a combat shotgun. Combat shotguns are a bit cheaper for House Goliath, and they are excellent, excellent weapons, mainly because you have a template weapon on them, and also because you have a second profile that's damaged too. Um, pretty much like a bolt gun, uh, actually, with rapid fire as well. The last two fighters, we've gone for one bully and one forgeborn. The bully is like your juve. Um, this, in this instance, we've gone for an axe and a stub gun, um, and we've given him terminal biology, which is a sort of downgrade. It means that he, if he gets injured, he can die a bit more. Um, can die a bit more reliably, but that takes 10 credits off him and makes him only 40 credits, um, which is excellent. I've also got a Forgeborn there, which is your prospect. And contrary to how I used to think about the Forgeborn, I actually have done a bit of thinking about it. I think they're quite valuable just because they are slightly higher movement. So I've included one in this list, um, only with a stub gun, so I couldn't afford anything else. And he's also got um, terminal biology as well to make him only 30 credits, which is very cheap indeed. But movement five on a Goliath list, just having one fighter with movement five can be quite useful. You can get objectives and do stuff that you might not be able to do without having it. So I think it's really valuable there. But yeah, seven fighters in a Goliath list. I mean, Goliaths, when they bottle, they tend to stick around, but just having seven fighters does mean that you're prolonging that bottle check being made in the first instance. Seven is the magic number when it comes to Necromunda. Now for the Daka Daka shooty boys of House Orlock. These guys are known for their solid rounds and sort of short to mid-range mid effectiveness, I suppose. This list, I think, is incredibly powerful and easily, um, easily can do work against all of the other lists that I've mentioned so far. House Orlock are really good with the new book as well. They're definitely much more exciting and much more interesting to play than they ever have been before. But getting into it though, we've got a captain, a road captain here, and this is the sort of tank, this is what I call the tank build. Um, it's pretty damn, um, it's pretty damn ridiculous to be honest. We've got uh, a road captain here. The thing that stands out with road, ca road captains is that they have three wounds base, which is more than any other leader in the game, um, except for maybe Ogrins. But um, yeah, three wounds is amazing. Uh, I've combined that with a stub gun and a bolt gun and a chainsaw. So you've got some nice range and damage output with the bolt gun. You've also got some good close combat reliability with your chainsaw, plus one to hit in close combat and parry. 
uh, with rending and you've also got the stub gun as well for your pistol weapon too so he's got a nice bit of balance really similar to the goliath build actually that i made however this guy's even more tough than your goliath in a way having that three wounds as well i've also given him true grit to make him extra uh, hardy as well and of course um, with house orlock you've got the um the legendary names as well so you get almost like a second skill when you build them and the the one that i've gone for here is kind of hilarious and that is iron hard iron hard means that you can ignore your first out of action or serious injury in the game at the cost of automatically failing your first bottle check however um, it's just so good i mean you've got three wounds and then all of a sudden you die and then you're not dead um, it's just brilliant especially in conduct conjunction with true grit as well um, mesh armor is the armor on the road captain as well but that is your tanky orlock build for you uh, the next one is your arms master and this is your specialist champion arms masters are great um, in a different way to most specialist champions and they are more for the gang than they are for themselves um, having a, a couple of extra special rules and bonuses that they can apply to your all lot gang are really really valuable if you ask me um, this one we've gone for a fighting knife because you don't get many options for the for the starting weapons for an arms master we've got a fighting knife just in case he does get in close combat and a combat shotgun now combat shotguns are already good but now we're combining it with a skill called shotgun savant which means that your short range is your long range etc as well which is really really cool with that rapid fire damage 2 minus 1 ap something or other knockback um, profile on it um, but yeah you've also got the template option on the combat shotgun as well um, and we've gone for iron stare as his, um, his his other skill there as well iron stare meaning that he's basically a corpse grinder you need to pass a willpower check if he's looking at you he's got line of sight on you you need to pass a willpower check to shoot him or fight him pretty cool um, or maybe it's just shooting i'm not sure um, but that's the arms master that i've got there the shotgun wizard um, the next one is your uh sort of all -lock champion your generic champion and this one i've gone for a heavy build with mesh armor bullet lord which means that you can turn any of your uh, or one of your rapid fire dice into a three uh, and a heavy stubber which is really really good indeed um, no um, suspenser on this of course but nerves of steel is the skill of choice on this so you can really put out a lot of daca using bullet lord if you really want to once per game um, but you can also um, remain standing with nerves of steel and a really high call there as well moving on to the orlock specialist now then so you probably by now as i've got to the fifth gang so far you've seen a bit of a pattern in my list building um, with specialists anyway if it's not a grenade launcher and if you don't get access to a grenade launcher then it's a long rifle uh, and then i'm not really sure but this specialist does get access to the grenade launcher so of course he's taking one we've got a grenade launcher flak armor and a spare auto gun just because why not um, having an extra backup weapon when you've got a grenade launcher with only um, six up ammo is quite nice to have um, we've then got a gunner with a combat shotgun because combat shotguns are just really really good um, so why not and you also get them on your starting list for house orlock um, and we've then gone for a another gunner which is a ganger with an auto gun as well um, neither of these fighters have armor unfortunately because you can't quite afford it in this list um, but the last but not least fighter in this gang list um, in this uh, seven crew here is your orlock wrecker now wreckers are your prospects and they're probably the best prospect they are the best prospects in the game they're fantastic they've got um, jump packs so they can move traverse the board a lot easier um, and they're just really good and actually if you give them this build that i've given them they can hit really really hard too so we've gone for a flail and a stub gun flail gives you plus one to hit um, you've also got plus one strength there as well and you can't parry it you've also got the jump booster in conjunction with that giving you extra um, bonuses to hit and strength as well um, and this is offset with a stub gun which is excellent at close range of course if these guys do become specialists they can take um, uh, gunfighter as a skill and you can give them two pistols which is pretty good later on down the track in a campaign but i think this is an excellent orlock starting list no there aren't any doggos on the starting list sure they're fun but they're not very good unfortunately um, but that's my orlock starting list i think it's really really powerful actually and gives you quite a lot of utility of course it is fairly sh you know short range but you have got the heavy stubber and the bolt gun um, and stuff there as well um, to provide a little bit of extra range there but I think it's a pretty good list anyway. What do you think? So my last recommended starting list here is of course House Van Saar, the irradiated pasty looking Dutchmen themselves. Um, they used to be my favorite gang in Necromunda, honestly, but now I just, I, I can't like them as much as I want to. 
This list is very cheesy, so I do apologize, um, but you, you kind of have to do it. I could have gone way more cheesy, believe me, but I decided to make it slightly more balanced, but it's still very cheesy. Anyway, Vansar with seven in your starting list, which is pretty good. Um, you, you do kind of want the numbers here, I think, because you can have all the gears and no ideas and be bottling very quickly with House Vansar if you're not careful, but seven fighters, I think, is pretty optimal for any gang. Um, Right, starting off, we've got your Prime, which is your leader, not Optimus Prime, but this is your Vansar um, leader of the pack. And he's, of course, got the Combi Laz Plaz weapon, which is excellent value. It's a combi weapon. You've got the lower profile on the plasma gun, along with the Laz pistol profile, which is very reliable and plentiful as a backup as well. Um, he's got mesh armor and an undersuit, giving him a four up save. So you have to take advantage of those undersuits as well. Um, and he's got fast shot, which means that you can shoot twice in a turn um, if you don't move, um, which with the plasma gun is really scary indeed. And when you've got ballistic skill two plus is even more scary. So that is your Avansar Prime, your leader there. The next one is your Org Mech, and he's basically built the same. Um, that's another, this is your champion. He's also got ballistic skill two plus. He's also got the Laz Plaz combo. He's also got the, uh, the undersuit and the mesh armor. Um, but instead of um, having fast shot, I mean, you could have fast shot as well, but instead of having fast shot as his starting skill, I've gone for trick shot, which is another one of my favorites, meaning that you're reducing cover. So hard cover becomes a minus one instead of a minus two and soft cover becomes none. Um, so again, very scary with plasma guns indeed. The next one is your Archaeotech. So your Archaeotech is kind of your special champion. Now, you, didn't, you don't have to take one of these. They're not that good. But I do think having one in your gang gives, gives, you, some, gives you something different, I suppose. Um, are they the most optimal choice? No, they're not at all. You could go with another Ormec, Org Mech with the Laz Plaz combo and be a dick. But go for the Archaeotech. It's slightly more fun. Um, it gives you more access to Cybernetica, and he's also just got some slightly different stuff that you can do. This guy is the only fighter in your entire gang who can do anything in close combat as well. We've got the Spider Rig, which is uh, quite nice. It's got versatile, I believe, as well, of three inches, which is fantastic. Uh, and we've given him a plasma pistol as well. So lots of plasma. Your leadership in general has three plasma weapons already, which is quite scary indeed. And we've got the armored body glove on him too. His skill, um, I've gone for Savant, and that is Fixer, giving you D3 times 10 credits at the end of each game. Um, nice to have with Vansar because their gear is quite expensive, and if you do lose a fighter, you're going to need money in a campaign to replace them because they are quite expensive. 240 credits for your Prime, 220 credits for your um, uh, Orgmec, and 255 credits for this guy. So money is key for House Vansar. Moving on to your specialist. Now this is the only specialist I haven't actually given a special weapon, but I bought a specialist in the starting list purely so that you can get that special weapon later on down the track, but we just couldn't f afford it in the starting list here. So instead we've given him a Laz pistol and a Laz sub carbine. Laz sub carbines are kind of like auto gun versions of Laz guns, but they're also plentiful, so they're easier to reload. Um, but that's nice too. He's also got mesh armor and armored body glove too for a hundred credits. Um, we've then got two juves now your subtext are your juves and they are excellent because they've got ballistic skill four plus which is far better than any other juve in the game which means that they're quite good at shooting um, and for 45 credits you can give them las guns um, uh, total cost um, a subtech with a las gun very reliable great fire support great for pinning uh, and very very cheap indeed as well so you know cheaper than even your escher um, gangers that are 55 credits with las guns Moving on, of course, to the last one in this, and that is, of course, your dickhead on a surfboard, which is the Neotech. Uh, in this instance, I've given the Neotech two Laz pistols, and the Neotechs are actually really good. They can fly around the board and offer something different. They're faster than the rest of your gang as well, so you can get objectives and open crates and just do annoying stuff. They're also surprisingly tanky as well, being that they can't be pinned. Um, but for 95 credits here, with two las pistols it's quite nice i believe you can actually give them las guns as well but i think the las pistols are a bit nicer on in this because if you do get sort of stuck in close combat at least you can use one in close combat as well um, that is my vansar starting list anyway so those were my six sort of Damon recommended um, starting lists for each of the six houses uh, of course i could have done multiple lists and um, really explored the options in building these and you can do whatever you want but 
The golden rule for me, and the thing that I would recommend for new, newer players generally, if you're building a list, give it some balance because it's no fun to play an all close combat list or an all shooting list. Give it some balance, have a bit of both if you can. Um, also have a bit of difference in range as well. Have some long range stuff, have some short range stuff, have some high damage dealing stuff, have some pinning stuff like las guns. Um, but the key thing, and the thing that I think is most important in list building Necromunda is numbers. Too few fighters means that you can have very, very quick games where you bottle out too early and generally lose that way. So again, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again, numbers are key in Necromunda and generally speaking, the gang with the higher numbers is going to have the advantage because you can out-activate your opponent and you're not going to bottle out too quickly as well. So all of these lists have taken that into account. They've taken balance into account. They've taken damage into account. They've taken optimization of skills into account. Um, yes, of course, I could have gone more cheesy, more spammy, but I think these are the best six starting recommended lists that I could possibly give you based on my own experience in the game. Um, so I hope you appreciate this video. Again, please like, share, subscribe. I've just um, started a Twitch account. I've no idea what I'm doing with it, so please give me some help with that. But go give me a follow on there too. And also, of course, please do check out my Patreon as well. That's the only way you can keep this channel going. Um, eventually, I'm going to need some help with that uh, if I want to um, do more and expand and buy more equipment and stuff as well. So do please become a Patreon. Um, and I will catch you in the next video. Peace out.